who stock up through spring ball lots of guys on locked on sooners you are locked on sooners your daily podcast on the oklahoma sooners part of the locked on podcast network your team every day What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash College. Terms and conditions apply. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John Nine Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on X at Josh on Ref. And the show is at Locked On Sooners. And Josh, we're going to talk some spring stock up for several players. But I want to start at the quarterback position. We ob- obviously know Jackson Arnold is going to be the starting quarterback. But I think we might be entering the QB2 quarterback battle territory with as much buzz as Michael Hawkins has created so far through the spring. It uh, certainly sounds like it. The buzz that you're hearing coming out of camp is that uh, – well, and it's not altogether surprising, but Michael Hawkins has been really impressive. Impressive enough, John, to where, and probably a lot of people were already sort of at this place, uh, even though you went and you got Casey Thompson and he's got some Power Five starting experience and uh, has uh, a number of other starts and career games even outside of that. Probably a lot of people were at the place that maybe Michael Hawkins, based on being a blue chipper and what you've seen on film would have a chance to be Oklahoma's backup quarterback. But now based on what, you know, you just listen to the folks that are in the know that get uh, that uh, access. Well, at practice, they they get to go watch a a little bit of this. And Michael Hawkins sounds like maybe he is in fact trending right toward that backup quarterback role. At the very least, he's going to compete for that spot. I believe, you know, Casey Thompson, when he gets back and he gets back healthy, will probably get that first crack at backing up Jackson Arnold if and when or if a scenario arises in which, hey, Arnold's lost for a series or two or for a quarter or, God forbid, any any longer than that. But it would not surprise me in the least if Michael Hawkins usurps that spot and and earns that opportunity because of the potential that he has. I mean, we've talked about it since, you know, he first kind of came on Oklahoma's radar as a potential prospect and, and commitment. The dude is a, a true dual threat player. He's got a big arm. He throws with accuracy. I mean, he does, does everything. It's just a matter of getting him up to speed and ready to play at the collegiate level. Another guy that's been making a lot of noise is another new addition and a former quarterback, and that's Bauer Sharp. Now, the southeastern Louisiana transfer, you know, came in with some intrigue. And I think a lot of people likened him to a Blake Bell because obviously former quarterback transitioned to tight end. But we might be looking at a player that is potentially more athletic than a Blake Bell. And again, somebody who's been making a lot of noise in spring ball. Absolutely. The the noise to where you're you're starting to kind of hear rumblings that Bauer Sharp is somebody that we need to really seriously keep an eye on in terms of a starting capacity for Oklahoma. Time will tell on that front, but uh, this isn't somebody that you just turn the nose up, Southeast Louisiana, Lion transferring over and coming in. This is somebody that legitimately, athletically, has turned some some heads so far uh, in Oklahoma's spring work. So, you know, if I were to power rank players that uh, I'm most excited to kind of watch at the spring game now, I think we've named the top two. So far, Uh, you know, obviously want to see what's going on with the offensive line, Uh, you know, just up front in general. You're always watching the trenches. But what does Michael Hawkins, the quarterback, have in store for us at the spring game? And Bauer Sharp, is he going to go out and make a bunch of plays? You know, 29 grabs a season ago, uh, just skinny at 300 yards, three touchdowns receiving. The way that people are talking about him, John, is that this could be a big time helper in solving what were some pretty legitimate woes at tight end a season ago. And if that's the case, well, now all of a sudden you start taking stock of everything else around Bauer Sharp, and if Devon Mitchell is a, a bona fide stud coming in, and if Helms 
and McIntyre takes some legitimate steps forward, then, okay, all of a sudden you're looking at a tight end room that is uh, no longer something you look at and, uh, and shudder a little bit like we did a season ago. Yeah, all fall this past season, we're asking, okay, when is the tight end room going to step up? When are we going to see that breakout game? And we never saw it. It never really materialized. But now you're seeing a guy like Sharp who – potentially could answer that question in the passing game at the very least. We'll have to see what he looks like as a blocker when we get into like game like action in the spring game. But you've got some guys with a lot of potential beyond Bauer Sharp, but it sounds like things are moving in a really, really positive direction. there. sticking on the offense right now. Heath Ozida, friend of the show. We had Heath on way back when, when he you know first committed to Oklahoma, and we were really intrigued by the prospect of what he could mean for Oklahoma's offensive line. Obviously, as a freshman, didn't really get a lot of opportunities. But I remember last fall at OU Media Day, Brent Venables talking about him as the, one of the most athletic people that they had on the roster. And now we're looking at him potentially taking on a starting role as a left guard. He's created a ton of buzz himself. Yeah, that's uh, tremendous to hear that Ozida's doing that. Uh, obviously, anywhere you look along the offensive line for Oklahoma, there's serious questions given that uh, you're replacing all five starters or four again, as we've discussed on many an occasion, if you include Sexton uh, into that mix, uh, then you'd say, okay, well, there's one returning starter, but Oklahoma offensive tackles, guards, center, there's question marks all over. Ozida is somebody that uh, had promise coming in and he would be, you know, among a number of names for Oklahoma. That's kind of in that grouping, John, to where, okay, uh, ha have been here now for a year, and is it time to take a leap to where you can be a legitimate starter, and not just a placeholder starter, a starter that can take Oklahoma back to where Oklahoma wants to be, which is a Joe Moore award-winning type of offensive line. Well, and hopefully you're getting multiple years of starting work out of a guy like that that does take over. You know, we'll be watching the center position, obviously, at the spring game. Without Troy Everett, we're going to be seeing a lot of Josh Bates, uh, a lot of Josh Isosa, some Gary and Hatchet as well. That'll be a position to watch. But left guard looks like maybe solidified uh, with the Heath Ozida there. And hopefully that helps to solidify your offensive line as well, because you got to have those guys blocking well up front for your running backs. And one of those running backs that seems to be making a lot of noise and might push for that RB two spot is one Caleb Hicks, the Denton Ryan commitment. Uh, the, you know, the dude is just a football player. He's a really, really, really good football player. Denton Ryan during his last couple of years, didn't really throw the ball a whole lot. They asked him to run the ball a ton and he was very, very productive. You know, we expect Gavin Sawcheck to be the starter. Javante Barnes, I think a lot of people expect to be the backup, but Caleb Hicks might push for a lot of those snaps too. Well, that would be tremendous if uh, he's able to work himself into that type of role for Oklahoma. Sawchuk feels like the slam dunk, no doubter, uh, because of the way he finished the season last year. But, you know, need I remind you, we felt that way about both Sawchuk and Barnes this time a year ago. So, I, hey, man, I, I'm right out there. I'm uh, I'm leading the band on the, the Gavin Sawchuk hype train, right? Uh, come on down. I think he's going to be special. I think he's already shown us that. But running back in general has uh, the position, has a way of just seeing guys get banged up. So you can't rely on one. And uh, obviously if Hicks – can make that type of transformation to go along with Tatum that everybody's excited about. Barnes, uh, we'll see, right? Uh, he says he's healthy, but now you're kind of in the, okay, I need to see it. That uh, That's promising, though. I, I do think Oklahoma has, uh, which is not surprising for OU, I think they've got you know four or five running backs that they can feel really good about. And I think they got a star right now in Sawchuck, and okay, you're trying to identify who's the second star. Yeah, defensively, a couple guys that have made some noise Jacoby Johnson, uh, Lewis Carter. I feel like Reggie Powers also has been making some noise as a true freshman, but Robert Spears Jennings at safety. Also, a lot of people are excited about him. Any other names that you've kind of been hearing some buzz about through spring ball that people should be aware of and, and be on the lookout for come spring game? Well, let's dive into that Jacoby Johnson name a little bit. Uh, I love Jacoby's game. He uh, was fun to watch in high school for Mustang. Just go jump up, catch the football anywhere. Uh, was a menace both offensively and defensively. If if he's able to be a legitimate contributor for Oklahoma alongside Des Malone, uh, 
uh, alongside Gentry Williams and alongside others for Oklahoma at the corner position, then uh, I think that more comfortably allows OU to free up Woody Washington to go explore the cheetah a little bit. Uh, and same goes for, for Dolby and, and some others probably as well. So that is that could be a sneaky, important development if, in fact, Jacoby Johnson's ready to go out and you know be a legitimate starting-type corner or rotational corner for OU. Yeah, and they got to find some some depth, you know, because it, it's Woody Washington and then a bit of question mark. You know, we got to see how well Des Malone's game translates from, you know, the Mountain West to the SEC. Gentry Williams, we got to get healthy and keep healthy for a season. And then after that, we're we're waiting on a breakout from a Kanai Walker. And we're waiting on a breakout from Jacoby and Makari Vickers and Josiah Wagner. And development happens, and sometimes it happens on different timetables for every player. But if Jacoby can take that step and ascend to a starting level corner in the same way that Gentry Williams did the last year in his second year with the Sooners, then I think that that just creates a lot of opportunity and a lot of flexibility for the Oklahoma Sooners defense where you're not having to, you know, pigeonhole one guy here and there. And you get Jacoby's length on the field when you're going to be going up against some probably pretty tall SEC wide receivers as well. Uh, you know, on the Lewis Carter front to me, like there's going to be a number of linebackers that make noise because it's a really, really good group. And it's a deep group of players beyond Danny Stutzman. Obviously he's the, the guy that's got that all American potential top 100, top 50 potential draft pick in the 2025 NFL draft. But with Dasan McCullough and Jaron Kanick and Kip Lewis and Kobe McKenzie and Lewis Carter and Sam Omasigo and Phil Picciotti, man, that is a deep group of linebackers and James Nesta. Let's not forget, forget James Nesta. that could really uh, make an impact and help Oklahoma's defense get to that next level because it's got to be every level of the defense has to continue to get better. But linebacker has got the significant depth that, okay, you don't feel as much of a drop off when you go from, you know, your your number one next to Danny Stutzman to your number two. And hopefully those guys develop enough that when Danny Stutzman comes out of the game, you're not feeling as much of a drop off like you did in the fall with Kansas and Oklahoma state when Stutzman missed a game and a half and you weren't as good defensively as you were obviously with Stutzman, but you know, everything's getting better. All the depth is getting better, Josh. It is. And that's what uh, should be happening in the spring season. You ought to be accumulating and developing more depth. And linebacker is another one of those areas to where really outside of Danny Stutzman, you're trying to figure out, okay, who are the next couple of stars for OU? We've seen flashes from just about any other name involved in the mix there, but it can't be flashes. It needs to be consistency alongside Danny Stutzman for this defense to get to the place where everybody wants it to get to not next year, but right now with Stutzman and Bowman returning. And that's uh, to an elite level. Absolutely right. And you got to get consistency. And that's for all those young guys, all those freshmen and sophomore. They got to find that consistency week in, week out, practice in, practice out, snap in, snap out. One place that's getting more consistent because it's also getting a lot of depth, that's safety. Well, the Oklahoma Sooners added a commitment in the 2025 class. We'll talk about that next coming up here on Locked On Sooners. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does it all while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. That's why they're constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process easy and quick. 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. So go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. And every segment here on the Locked On Sooners and Locked On Podcast Network that is covering recruiting is brought to you by LinkedIn. Again, go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. So Josh, 
The Oklahoma Sooners get a commitment from Marcus Wimberly, Wimberly the 2025 four-star safety, according to Rivals. Uh, he's the first defensive back, although it won't be the last defensive back, technically the, the first defensive back, because you have some athletes that uh, could play defensive back for you. But Wimberly, out of Arkansas, out of Boxite, uh, is the first commitment, according to Parker Thune, from Arkansas since 2019. And uh, this is a guy that was being recruited by Arkansas by Michigan, by Tennessee, uh, of the notable uh, recruitment. So I think it's a big time get. You might go look at the three stars and think, okay, he's just a three-star kid. But again, look at those offers. The defending national champion, Michigan Wolverines, we're taking a look at him. Tennessee with Josh Heupel and his coaching staff with a defense that's improving each and every year. We're also taking a look at him. So it's an important commitment for the Oklahoma Sooners as they continue to develop that safety room. First uh, Arkansas commit since uh, Stacy Wilkins. Is that right? Yeah, that's what that's what Parker was saying. So hopefully this one turns out a little bit better. Well, yeah, and, and not to draw that parallel, just uh, that that's kind of right, interesting Stacey. that uh, it's been, you know, since Stacy Wilkins uh, for Oklahoma to have gone into Arkansas and, and found uh, a commitment. But uh, Marcus Wimberly, 6'1", 200. So he's uh, he's the part physically. In that respect, and as you mentioned, uh, a nice offer sheet of, of course, the in-state name in Arkansas, but Wisconsin, Michigan, Ole Miss, Oregon, Tennessee, uh, all programs that were uh, on this offer sheet for Marcus Wimberly. And somebody out of the state of Arkansas in general, maybe, won't uh, won't always have maybe the same notoriety as you know somebody out of the Dallas Metroplex or so on and so forth. There's probably a number of Metroplexes that you could toss out there. But I, I like uh, what the tape looks like. I think that uh, obviously for Oklahoma, you love getting uh, another defensive back uh, here in the class for OU. And uh, again, the start for Oklahoma in this class, as we haven't even – past the spring game yet that's of course going to be a, a busy weekend for Oklahoma on the recruiting side in the weeks that uh, follow it Oklahoma's got 11 commits right now yeah we're, we're way ahead of schedule uh, compared to the 2023 and 2024 recruiting classes uh, but I also like just what he discussed and why it was important to go to Oklahoma he said the culture was the biggest thing and that starts with Brent Venables and his coaching staff and sole mission obviously being a big part of that it's it's that holistic view of the person he's not just a football player we're trying to develop not just a football player but a man as well and i think that resonates not just with you know parents but that's going to resonate with kids as well and that's going to resonate with high school students because especially the ones that are long-term thinking i mean myself I, when i was coming out of high school if i'd have gone into just what i wanted to go into and do the thing i would have wanted to do man i might have gone off to new york and tried my hand at you know at broadway waiting tables, trying to get auditions, all that jazz. Well, my parents and my, my choir teacher, all everybody spoke wisdom into me and said, hey, think let's think bigger picture than that. And here we are. But sometimes it's not always about, okay, the, the football side of things. Those other things move the needle too, and not just with the families, but it moves the needle with the kids too. So big shout out to Brent Venables and his staff for moving in a, in a direction that recruits the whole person doesn't just recruit the athlete and what they can do on the football field. Cause I think that's going to th be the thing that resonates long-term and also what keeps kids in house so that you're not having a one year and then they transfer out. Cause maybe they're not going to get the playing time right away. No, they're going to be bought in, not just to what potentially I could become as a football player, but because of what they're pouring into these people as people and as students and as athletes it's the whole picture. And, and I think that's why, you know, we look at, I think every off season, we worry that this deep wide receiver room that Oklahoma's got is going to see a guy like a, a Jaden Gibson going to the transfer portal because he could probably go start for 90 FBS teams right now and not have any issue, but he's staying bought in with Oklahoma for a lot of reasons. I don't know all the reasons exactly, but his time is coming. And, and I think that's why this culture thing means so much and it matters so much on the recruiting trail because it's not just about the immediate gratification for these players. It's big picture thinking. It's long-term thinking. And connecting with the the coaching staff and the vision that the coaching staff has, clearly uh, that's the case here for Marcus Wimberly. As we start you know, thinking forward here recruiting-wise, Trent Wilson – Malik Hawkins kind of uh, maybe right around the corner. Could we be looking at a Baker's dozen in short order? 
I mean, April 10th, everything speaks to and points to those guys being Oklahoma commits. Obviously, a commitment's not a signature, but things are trending really, really well for the Oklahoma Sooners right now. Obviously, you feel better about Malik Hawkins because of the familial connection. Michael Hawkins is on campus. Mike Hawkins played for Brent Venables. So there's there's a lot of ties there. Obviously, Trent Wilson, East Coast guy, Todd Bates, Miguel Chavis, they know the East Coast really well. They've recruited it really, really well. Uh, everything is pointing to Oklahoma all of the recruiting insiders from OU, National, Penn State, Texas A&M, doesn't matter where you look, everybody's looking at Trent Wilson to OU, but we'll see what comes down the pipeline on commitment day for the Sooners. Uh, but two four-star players that could be added to Oklahoma's 2025 recruiting class in short order. On the softball diamond, the Oklahoma Sooners took a little bit of a, I won't say a step back, but Things didn't go the way that everybody expected them to go down in Austin. We're going to talk about Oklahoma's series loss to the Longhorns coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. So the Oklahoma Sooners made the trip down to Austin uh, to uh, see if they could keep their streak alive against the Longhorns, but uh, a series winning streak that went back to 2009 against Texas, a big 12 series or what was it? Yeah. Big 12 series streak, or they hadn't lost a series since 2011, but hadn't lost to the Longhorns in a series in 2009. Uh, you know, things started off pretty well. Kelly Maxwell pitched a really, really good game through six innings against Texas on Friday night. Obviously in the seventh inning, things got really, really interesting uh, as Texas came up to the plate with Katie Stewart and had an opportunity to tie the game. She represented the game tie or the tying run uh, with two runners on, but grounded out uh, with a phenomenal play by Tiara Jennings to end the game. Uh, but Jada Coleman had a three run bomb to really break that open and help Oklahoma get the victory. But in the next two games, and this is going to be what everybody's talking about until Oklahoma takes the diamond again is, or uh, probably until Oklahoma plays against some top competition Oklahoma was held to one run in each of the Saturday and Sunday games, both losses to the Texas Longhorns had opportunities, got bases, got runners on base in each of those games, but whether it was a, a running miscue or just some unlucky situational ball, uh, both on Saturday and Sunday, there was a line out uh, one to the pitcher. And then, you know, I can't remember where uh, Lina Torres lined out to, but both times got the runner doubled up on first, uh, you know, throws at the plate that didn't go Oklahoma's way. Just a lot of things that just didn't go Oklahoma's way in this and in, in a game that's as tight as these were, you got to have some luck sometimes, but also it, they just didn't hit well. And that's, that happens. You know, Texas had a really, really good game plan. They approached Oklahoma in, in a, with a really solid plan and Oklahoma wasn't able to adjust uh, quick enough. And I don't think it writes the story about the Sooners for 2024, but they certainly have some some work to do and they've got some bouncing back to do as well. John, it had been 13 years since OU lost a Big 12 softball series. Crazy. It's crazy. So, look, we can break this down and, and we will, but wrap your mind around that for a second. 13 years since they lost a, a pair of games to Missouri and obviously 15 since they had lost a, a series to Texas. So, Look, uh, you, you got to tip the cap. Texas was great. The uh, really, you know, honestly, for all three games, they were they were pretty good. Uh, losing by three runs to Oklahoma is uh, a consolation prize to a number of teams around the country. And then obviously they came back, and Gutierrez was uh, marvelous in the circle. And then Kavan and uh, and Check were really good in the circle for for Texas as well. So you just got to say that Texas was really good at home, and they pitched incredibly well. And uh, Oklahoma was not itself, and a big part of that is because of who Texas was in this series. So uh, Texas has stamped itself as a legitimate national championship contender because of what they did at home to uh, to Oklahoma in this series. Now, having said all of that, I, I don't think it's all bad for OU. And OU lost each game by one run. So I do think there's encouragement to be taken from Kelly Maxwell and Nicole May both pitched well, and mm -hmm. you just couldn't go find the offense for whatever reason in this series. Again, a lot of that credit goes to Texas. So, but uh, 
Are there alarm bells sounding? Absolutely not. Could I see Oklahoma winning every single game the rest of the season? Yes, I absolutely could. But, hey, let's see what happens next because Oklahoma got punched in the mouth for the first time uh, in a long time. In a long time, yeah. You know, you, you, I think you mentioned it right. The pitching was really good. I've seen different you know, people out on Facebook. I've seen them on Twitter talking about the pitching not being good enough. And I'm like, when you hold one of the top five offenses in the country, the number two team batting average in the country to four runs on Saturday and Sunday combined and two more runs on Friday, I think you're doing pretty good for yourself pitching wise. Was it, did you win? No. So technically quote unquote, you could say it wasn't good enough, but it was good enough. Your vaunted offense that leads the nation and runs per game needed to be better. Uh, you know, or at least maybe their second runs per game, but they got, they had to be better. They, and that's just where it comes from. And, you know, it could have been just the road trip. It might have, and it was back to back road trips for them. They had to go to Kansas a week ago to Austin this week. Uh, you know, maybe get back home, get refreshed, get re-energized, and that could help them a little bit. But sometimes those back-to-back road trips can get you. You know, Texas was coming off of a disappointing weekend up in Stillwater uh, where they got shut out twice by Lexi Kilfoyle. I mean, that was that was a big bounce back for them to have their pitchers go in there and say, hey, we're going to go toe-to-toe. And again, it was they were pitching duels, those you know the Saturday and Sunday games. And even the Friday game was a pitching duel. Mac Morgan threw really, really well until Jada – got her for that three run bomb. Like she had been throwing pretty good in that game, keeping Oklahoma's offense pretty stifled. And that's what you get when you're the number two team in, in ERA in the nation. So, you know, again, no alarm bells. This is just Texas. They had a really good series. Oklahoma didn't have its best series, whether at the plate or on the base paths. And that's just the way softball goes sometimes. And, you know, you get, get ready to come back. You get Wichita state on Tuesday, and then you get back to big 12 play next weekend. And man, by the time we get to big 12 tournament play, I mean, obviously that bedlam series is going to be huge at this point with, you know, not being able to create any distance uh, from Texas in the uh, big 12 standings. I mean, everything's going to be huge now moving forward. Sure. It's now a race. Mm -hmm. That's probably the biggest takeaway out of this is now it's a race between Oklahoma, Texas and uh, Oklahoma state based on what happened uh, down in Austin. But Look, uh, I think Patty Gasso pushing the right buttons, at least with the first loss, by saying, we needed this. We, 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 you don't want to say you needed a loss, but the air of invincibility, once again, now three times this season has been Oklahoma's bubble of invincibility has been popped. Mm -hmm. How will Oklahoma respond? I would imagine they will have a championship response to it. But that remains uh, to be seen for this Oklahoma team. I do think the encouraging thing was, Again, the the pitching was great throughout this series against Texas. Would you like to have gone and had a, a shutout three days? Sure. Everybody wants to do that every game. But giving up two runs to that team on uh, in three games, you ought to feel like Oklahoma, you're going to win every single time. You give up one or two runs in a game or we're going to extras and we're going to go win it there. That didn't happen this weekend. And I, I choose to take that as positive, not negative for OU. Well, and – they were a perfect relay throw away from potentially tying up that sec that second game on Saturday. You know, the um Caden Hardy, I believe it was, the center fielder for Texas, gets the ball perfectly off the wall and makes a great throw uh into the infield. That's again a perfect relay to the throw. Now you can we can debate the obstruction call. I don't think it was obstruction based on the rule because she moved up the line, moved into the base path because of the throw. Um, but man, everything had to go right for Texas on that. And the, and it did, they executed it perfectly and caught Maya Bland at the plate. Uh, you know, again, they had opportunities. Oklahoma did, didn't go their way, just the way it goes, but you can't put yourself in those situations to, to need that kind of a play to go your way in order to win a, uh, win a softball game. But again, Oklahoma is going to bounce back. This is a team that has played so well for so long at this point that, I mean, sometimes maybe you just think, Hey, we're, we're good enough to go do it every time. And we don't have to be at our best. Well, in a lot of these games, you're going to have to be at your best going down the stretch. So 
Can't wait to talk to Alex Sirocco this week about that one. It's going to be a fun conversation. So make sure you're tuned in to Locked On Sooners wherever you get your podcast. We're free and available on all platforms. Subscribe to the show over on YouTube as well and uh, hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref, myself at John Nine Williams. And also go check out Locked On Sports today. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on the Amazon Fire TV in the free fire tv channels app locked on sports today is here for you 24 7 covering the the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of locked on plus our national shows covering every league find locked on sports today now available on the free fire tv channels app but until next time he's josh helmer i'm john williams and hey even though roman reigns lost we still the ones and you the twos texas longhorns talk to you next time boomer sooner